Item number, SCP-004. Object class, Euclid. Special containment procedures. When handling items SCP-004-2 through SCP-004-13, proper procedure is vital. The items are not permitted to be moved off-site unless accompanied by two Level 4 security personnel. Under no circumstances should any other component of SCP-004 be taken through SCP-004-1. The effects of doing so are as yet unknown, and the current cost of experimentation makes further research impractical. Should any of the objects contained within SCP-004-1 breach containment, or the facility be breached, the keys must be brought inside and the door closed prior to activation of Site-62's on-site warhead. Unauthorized removal of keys from the testing area is grounds for immediate termination. Level 1 clearance is required for basic access to SCP-004-1. Level 4 clearance is required for use of SCP-004-2-13. Description SCP-004 consists of an old wooden barn door, SCP-004-1, and a set of 12 rusted steel keys, SCP-004-2 through SCP-004-13. The door itself is the entrance to an abandoned factory and data expunged. Chronological History July 2nd, 1949. A group of three juveniles trespassing on federal property near find the door. According to their testimony, they found a set of rusted keys in an iron lockbox and determined what door the keys unlock. The juveniles are taken into custody after they contact Sheriff when one of their friends, SCP-004-CAS-01, goes missing. July 3rd, 1949. Local authorities find the severed right hand of SCP-004-CAS-01, 8 kilometers from SCP-004-1. Other parts of SCP-004-CAS-01's body are found scattered as far as 32 kilometers from the factory. Under interrogation, the apprehended juveniles tell authorities that upon opening the door with one of the keys, SCP-004-CAS-01 was torn into several pieces each of which disappeared. At this point, the SCP Foundation takes over the investigation. July 4th, 1949. SCP Agent <laughs> obtains the keys from the local authorities to begin testing. Tests show that SCP-004-2 through SCP-004-13 all fit into a single lock on the large barred door. Twelve Class D personnel are assigned to test the effects of the door. Of the 12 test subjects each trying a different key to enter the room, only two survive. Opening the door with any key except SCP-004-7 or SCP-004-12 caused the test subjects to be torn apart in multiple directions. However, no dismembered parts were found until later. At the time of writing, only two parts of each subject have been recovered, with the exception of the subject using SCP-004-1 whose pieces were scattered in close proximity. The others have, for all intents and purposes, vanished from existence. Of the two surviving subjects, only one, having used SCP-004-7, returned unharmed. The other came back in a near catatonic state, able only to remove himself from the room and then collapse on the floor, and had to be restrained to prevent him from gouging out his eyes. The subject using SCP-004-7 said that he had entered a large room, impossibly big for the size of the attached building. After his exit, SCP-004-1 was propped open, and an armed squad of Level 3 personnel entered. The size of the room is impossible to measure, and the doorframe and the individuals in the room are the only part of the room that can be felt or illuminated. July 16, 1949. The juvenile suspects and sheriff are terminated. August 2nd, 1949. It is declared a hazardous area due to unexploded ordnance and fences erected in order to prevent civilian ingress. Tests to determine safety of exposure to environment behind SCP-004-1 begin. December 1st, 1950. Space-time anomalies resulting from exposure to SCP-004 are confirmed. Testing is suspended until further notice. July 2nd, 19... 
The unaccounted for remains of SCP-004-CAS-01 appear unexpectedly outside SCP-004-1. Despite being killed decades before, the remains of SCP-004-CAS-01 are not decomposed in any manner and are still warm to the touch. Blood remains uncoagulated. The remains are remanded for testing. July 4th, 19... The unaccounted for remains of one of the twelve original test subjects appear in similar manner to those of SCP-004-CAS-01. The remains have been designated SCP-004-CAS-02. Records suggest that both SCP-004-CAS-01 and CAS-02 used SCP-004-1. March 21st, 1999 with the massive proliferation of nuclear weapons and World War III only years away, construction has begun on a site inside SCP-004-1. The site is to stock supplies for person days. April 21st, 1999. Has ordered the site inside SCP-004-1 to be expanded to include emergency storage for all mobile SCP specimens and a petabyte database for the storage of all SCP data. The facility is now referred to as Site-62. September 25th, 2000. Site-62 is operational. Labs and containment units are complete and can contain the most dangerous specimens. Backup of the SCP database has begun. January 25th, 2001. Due to time anomalies, see space-time anomalies below. All personnel working at Site-62 are now required to reside on site permanently. Families of personnel are to be informed that loved ones perished in an industrial accident. Cloned bodies have been prepared for funeral. August 14th, 2003. Massive power outage across Northeast United States and throughout Canada. Due to the initial failure of multiple SCP generators, Site-62 was without power for 53 minutes. During those 53 minutes, those on site were completely without any source of light. They reported sensing creatures and people, although no abnormal entities could be seen or felt. Selected facility personnel were allowed to read <laughs> Appendix A, and said the creatures sensed were of humanoid size, but otherwise similar to the massive green creature described. Space-Time Anomalies SCP-004 seems to propagate spatio-temporal anomalies. Personnel leaving the facility report losing time. Those who have been in the site for weeks insist that they had only been in the facility for several days, and records of work completed and supplies consumed support their claims. Other temporal anomalies involve SCP-004-2 through 13, especially the reappearance of SCP-004-CAS-01 and SCP-004-CAS-02 exactly years after using SCP-004-1 has been assigned to investigate all aspects of these time anomalies. Spatial anomalies include the impossibly large dimensions of the area opened by SCP-004-7. Similarly, the 2003 blackout incident suggests that there exists an alternate plane of existence within the same space that Site-62 occupies. Additional Notes Testing on SCP-004 reveals that 10 of the keys open SCP-004-1 on a dimension where the laws of physics and topology are significantly different than those of our home dimension. Test subjects meeting these hostile conditions are torn apart, their body parts deposited in various locations, only three of which have been verified to be on Earth. Material deposited at two of these points appears immediately. Material deposited at the third appears exactly years into the future. The other seven locations are currently unknown. Current testing focuses on two avenues of research. The first is finding ways to survive SCP-004's hostile topologies. The second, data expunged, suggests that SCP-004-2 through 13 may open doors other than SCP-004-1. Appendix A, Mental Health Effects of SCP-004-12 all Class D personnel using SCP-004-12 return in a catatonic state, unable to speak. Some may have enough energy left to try to claw out their eyes. Of the 16 subjects, only 4 have survived. 
only one has regained speech following long-term psychotherapy. He was able to tell the psychiatrist that he saw a massive green creature, so large that much of its body extended beyond his field of view. He reported innate fear and sudden recognition, as if it were something buried deep in his primal fears, and forced implantation of incomprehensible memories. Subject displays acute anterograde and retrograde amnesia. Appendix B, additional information. Item number, SCP-004-14. Date of discovery, September 2nd, 1950. Origin of object. Object was discovered elsewhere in factory area, in the previously undiscovered manager's office. Description. Object appears as a large unvarnished wooden box. The box may be unlocked by the safe key, SCP-004-7, as well as five of the unsafe keys. Upon unlocking SCP-004-14 with SCP-004-7, the box opens automatically on hinges. The volume of the space inside is precisely five times greater than the outer dimensions imply. Items placed within while the lid remains open do not affect the weight or any other properties of the box. When the lid is closed and locked, however, all items inside vanish irretrievably. Personnel locked inside the box are also irretrievable, although losing personnel in this fashion appears to affect significantly the dreams experienced by Data Expunged. Item Number SCP-052 Object Class Euclid Special Containment Procedures Although it is not possible to remove SCP-052 from the New York subway system, its predictable behavior allows the Foundation to prevent the public from encountering it. The 59th Street ABCD station is to be closed to the public from 11pm to 1am, on Saturdays and Sundays, under the pretext of track maintenance. During that time, the station is to be staffed with agents from Mobile Task Force Gamma-6. Agents have been ordered to prevent accidental public access to the station, and to capture anyone seen leaving SCP-052. Anyone who has been on SCP-052 must be transported to Site-21 for debriefing and processing. Members of the public who see SCP-052 may be released after the administration of a Class B amnestic. Description. SCP-052 is a Type R4 New York City subway train. Official records indicate this train was built in 1932 and decommissioned for scrap in 1975. Nevertheless, it continues to appear on the Uptown AD track at the 59th Street and 8th Avenue station at 11.57 p.m. every Saturday. The train is in perfect condition and labeled as an A-train. SCP-052 appears at the designated time opens its doors to accept and discharge passengers for approximately five minutes, then closes its doors and disappears. It does not appear to ever contain passengers, except for those leaving the train during its appearance. The majority of subjects that have boarded SCP-052 have not been recovered. Passengers leaving SCP-052 claim to have boarded on various dates, from 1976 up to 2204. The latter claims he thought SCP-052 was a 300th anniversary special train. Subjects retain no knowledge of time on board. Addendum. Passengers leaving SCP-052 must be brought to Site-21 and interrogated to determine their origin and possible threat to the current time stream. Generally, passengers from the past may be given Class A amnestics and reintegrated into society. Passengers from the future must be held indefinitely. Site-21 currently holds 26 recovered passengers. Despite our protocols to prevent public access, we are still receiving subjects from the future. Although some are from alternate timelines, it is possible SCP-052 will begin to appear at another time and place, requiring expanded containment. The Foundation has placed several subjects onto the train in an attempt to understand its activities when not visible. Test 052-1 May 31st, 2009. Agent placed on train. Not recovered as of present date. Test 052-2. June 6th, 2009. Agent enters train. Not recovered, as he apparently returned to 1980 and was killed in a confrontation with Test 052-3. See notes on recovered passenger 052-4. After test 052-3, O5 Command issued orders that no further agents should be risked as passengers on SCP-052. 
Consideration has been given to using Class D personnel in their place, but the risk of releasing them into the past is too great. Log of recovered passengers in Foundation custody. Passenger 052-1. Entered train July 14th, 2012. Recovered. March 8th, 2008. Notes. An accountant, on the way home from the theater when she entered the train, 052-1 has expressed surprise and dismay to have traveled back in time four years, but appears to be otherwise unchanged and unharmed. She has been determined to currently exist in this timeline, and must be held indefinitely to prevent unwanted temporal effects. Passenger 052-2 Entered train June 12, 1976 Recovered March 15, 2008 Notes Subject entered train when lost on the way to Studio 54. Although unharmed and not a temporal threat, 052-2 is being held as the examining psychiatrist believes 32 years is too long a period over which to facilitate successful reintegration. Passenger 052-3 Entered train December 6, 2014. Recovered June 20, 2009. Notes A tourist from Jacksonville, Florida. Subject 052-3 now speaks Albanian instead of English. Held due to O5 orders regarding subjects from the future, as well as possible reintegration difficulties. Passenger 052-4 Entered train June 13th, 2009. Recovered June 27th, 2009. Notes. Agent from test 052-3. Agent returned with his hand surgically removed and a note in his pocket with the message, Send no more. Subject does not remember his experience on the train, but when subjected to hypnosis, revealed, data expunged. Passenger 052-5. Agent entered train at unknown future date, in violation of protocol. On July 11, 2009, body of subject was violently thrown from the train, landing 10 meters away. On examination, subject was found to have been data expunged. Whether security should be increased to prevent subject from entering SCP-052 is under consideration. Passenger 052-6 Claims to be a Level 4 Supervisor from the SCP Federation who entered the train in December 2124. Subject had been administered a Class A Prime Amnestic prior to boarding, in a successful attempt to avoid the fate of passengers 052-4 and 052-5. Recovered February 6, 2010. As he will never be released from Foundation custody, O5 Command has approved sharing otherwise classified information about other artifacts in our possession, in hopes of gaining new methods of containment, and becoming aware of future security breaches. Agent has been cooperative, and claims that it is good we do not know how to open SCP-699. Subject turned visibly pale and refused to discuss this item further. To be a survivor of the Great Zombie Plague of 2092, caused by an SCP-008 containment breach. That SCP can be killed by data expunged. Permission to try this has been denied by O5. That he worked for Dr. Jack Bright. Item number, SCP-110, Object Class, Euclid. Special Containment Procedures. The entrance to SCP-110 is to remain closed off at all times, unless otherwise permitted by O5. The land covering SCP-110, roughly six square kilometers, is to be developed into a suburban area that will not attract the attention of the general public. Any movement that SCP-110 might make is to be explained as minute seismic activity. Further complaints are to be ignored. Description: SCP-110 is an entire city that was found buried 0.5 kilometers underneath a large farm in Data Expunged, New York. Survey teams 2 and 3 concluded that the amount of surface area that the city is buried under covers approximately 6 square kilometers. Numerous items of high interest have been discovered within SCP-110 and will henceforth be labeled as SCP-110-XX. Known History of SCP-110 110819 A large earthquake occurs in rural New York, far from any city centers. The only casualties were a man and his dog, so no significant media attention was given to the event. 1505-19 Minor earthquakes continue to occur in SCP-110's general area. 
the U.S. federal government dispatches a team of geologists to the site to determine the cause. Results come back inconclusive. 16059 SCP Excavation Team 3 is ordered to investigate the site. Upon arrival, the team is greeted by SCP-110-01, who is then detained and moved to data expunged for further questioning. 2405-19 Information gained from SCP-110-01 and SCP- Reveal that there has been a large temporal disturbance in the area of SCP-110 that has been causing earthquakes due to displacement of soil and rock. Another SCP excavation team is sent to the site. 0902-2000 After many months of work, SCP excavation teams 4 and 5 are only able to reveal the strong, impenetrable, concrete-like shell of SCP-110. Investigation is halted until further information becomes available. 2507-2000 Due to the recent decoding and decryption of the files contained on SCP- Schematics of SCP-110 have become available. Excavation teams 4 and 5 are sent back on site to locate the primary entrance of SCP-110. 0408-2000 The entrance to SCP-110 has been discovered and the excavation teams are immediately met with what can only be described as a foul odor. SCP-110 had been an active Class IV city, but due to a temporal accident, its core services were heavily damaged, and the entire city was displaced. Work begins to cover up the existence of SCP-110, its excavation, and the thousands of dead civilians inside. Layout of SCP-110 the general layout of SCP-110 is essentially a series of concentric rings connected by tram, train, and other transportation lines. Surveyors have determined that SCP-110 has numerous sections and levels to it, all with specific functions, which shall be described in greater detail here. Core Services The numerous maps found posted in what were high-traffic areas of SCP-110 labeled a central column of assorted utilities as Core Services. Upon exploration, which was limited due to heavy security restrictions, SCP Exploration Team 1 discovered a myriad of technologies that kept the underground city self-sufficient. Among these technologies were a series of matter reconstitution chambers, a combination reactor that provided energy from both nuclear fusion and geothermal sources, an elaborate water recycling system, and a large waste reconstitution area. The core is surrounded by numerous elevators and emergency stairwells. Numerous areas of the core have been assigned to certain personnel for research. Atrium Colossi This large, open, domed area surrounds the core, and apparently once held vegetation. The dome itself was a massive display, its composition undetermined, which was used solely to depict a sky as an indication of time of day. Numerous tram lines span at least three stories of the atrium, all leading to and from the core. Personnel have described them as looking like spokes in a wheel. Upon discovery, the death toll per area was highest in this area, suggesting that it was a high-traffic part of the city. Commercial Ring A ring of what used to be small, independently-owned shops and chains surrounds the Atrium Colossi. It is unknown whether or not commercial products were manufactured within the city. However, due to the immense size of the core itself and the city's apparent self-reliance, it is highly likely that the core possesses a manufacturing area. Habitation Ring A The styles of living spaces found in this area suggest that its inhabitants were the wealthiest of the city. Numerous documents found throughout the city seem to confirm this assumption as well. Habitation Ring B This entire ring was inhabited by the middle-class citizens of SCP-110. The area is still being searched for items of interest. To date, SCPs have been recovered from here. Habitation Ring C This ring was inhabited by the lower class citizens of SCP-110. It was found in extremely poor condition, and is currently being restored by SCP maintenance teams 1 through 12. It is speculated that due to its location furthest from the core, it suffered the most damage from the temporal disturbance. Damage to SCP-110 increases proportionally to distance from the core. Atria Vegis as so named by numerous maps, these atria were only slightly smaller in area than Atrium Colossi and provided an estimated 80% of all foodstuffs to the population of SCP-110. 
These atria were once open-air spaces, and thus suffered a great deal of damage upon arrival at the site, as it is estimated that SCP-110 was displaced at least 300 meters below its original position. Recovery of these atria is revealing advanced plant-growing technology that has useful applications. Atrium Animus Atrium Animus was responsible for the remaining 20% of foodstuffs. This atrium has at least 20 stories that were once modeled after the natural environments of the animals that were raised there. Each level had a tightly controlled climate and was subdivided so that different species of animals had no contact with one another. Some of the genetic labs attached to Atrium Animus were found intact and are currently being explored by personnel. Atria Recreus These atria were used for the sole purpose of recreation. They are found between the different habitation rings and typically consist of parks, artificial bodies of water, shopping malls, and other types of civilian recreation. These atria have been suggested for use with SCPs that require an outdoor-like environment or a temperature and humidity controlled environment. Conversion plans have been drawn up. SCP Research Ring This city apparently had its outermost ring devoted to research of safe and Euclid class SCPs, although no documentation within the city is able to confirm this ring's existence. This suggests that SCP-110 was not originally designed by the private sector and rather was used as cover for SCPs currently unknown. This ring is highly dangerous, as it has suffered the most damage out of all sectors of SCP-110, thus potentially freeing some of the more dangerous SCPs. Only two members of SCP Exploration Team 3 have survived exploring the ring. Their actions are contained within document number 110-F. Architectural Styles of SCP-110 SCP-110 has been confirmed to be of human origin and all materials used in its construction are terrestrial. The architectural styles of SCP-110 seem to vary depending on location. The main styles are listed below. Core Services Utilitarian Atrium Colossi Greco-Roman Revival applies to all atria. Commercial Ring Postmodern Habitation Ring A Art Deco Habitation Ring B Expressionist Habitation Ring C Utilitarian SCP Research Ring Too damaged to determine The different architectural styles of SCP-110 create a problem when attempting to ascertain the general era in which it was built. The earliest documents found claim that the city was built in data expunged by the data expunged group. Document number 001-A The Last Note To those who find this document my name is Stephen Kolsnick. Rather, my name was Stephen Kolsnick. I will be dead by the time you read this. I was the chief engineer of this city, as well as the director of the data expunged program, contained within the outer containment and habitation rings. Due to an accident with an entity known as data expunged, the entire city of has been dislocated from its original area of data expunged. Nobody here knows where we are. From what I have been able to observe, the outer rings have sustained heavy damage, and their contents are threatening the inhabitants of the inner rings. Though we are surely doomed anyway, as the core has sustained heavy damage. Three of the main life-sustaining services contained within the core are damaged beyond reasonable repair. Any attempts to repair them would take more time than we have left to live. Life support systems will go down soon. I would estimate that they have between four to ten hours of function left. To whoever finds this. Contain data expunged as best you can. Do not follow the same mistakes as our containment procedures had. If you do, you shall regret it. End document. List of notable SCPs found within SCP-110. Data expunged. Item number. SCP-112. Object class. Euclid. Special containment procedures. SCP-112 is contained within an abandoned amusement park, designated Site Said site is to be staffed with a standard complement of 12 armed guards in designated Amusatastic Land garb to prevent civilian interference. SCP-112's power supply is housed within a standard Foundation prefab building with two high security door locks and a standard staff of six security staff and one operator. Since all other rides in Site are intentionally disabled, 
civilian intervention is low. As the anomalous properties of SCP-112 occur regardless of its condition, only mandatory maintenance work is to be done on SCP-112. This also ensures that local civilians treat SCP-112 and its surroundings as abandoned and ignored. All tests involving SCP-112 must be conducted with a portable toilet nearby, as well as a small table with basic food and drink items. Description: SCP-112 is a steel sit-down roller coaster, formerly known as the Blue Steel Surfer. Built in 19 SCP-112 was marketed as the crown jewel of the amusement park. Initial testing of the ride resulted in extremely negative experiences from testing staff. When these reports became public knowledge, the financial repercussions of the failure of the Steel Surfer resulted in the parent company of the amusement park going bankrupt. The property was abandoned and undisturbed until a local gang broke into the park and reactivated the improperly disabled rides. SCP-112 included. When police attempted to arrest the members who were exiting SCP-112 after its inaugural ride, the riders began to attracting local media attention. Suspecting the ride had traits within its mandate, the Foundation purchased the park under the auspices of rebuilding the park as a musatastic land in order to test any potential anomalous properties from the ride. When SCP-112 is started, the ride functions as expected until Point Alpha, its primary drop. When a car reaches Point Alpha, the train vanishes. After three minutes, the estimated time the train would normally take, the train rematerializes at Point Omega, three meters from the coaster's starting point. Human subjects riding SCP-112 have a drastically different experience compared to outside observation. The time frame between Point Alpha and Point Omega is massively extended with subjective ride times ranging from four minutes to several months. The properties of the ride also vary from person to person. Most subjects report elements on the ride that do not exist on the ride proper, like bat wings, cobra rolls, and inclined loops. Subjects do not have any sense that the rest of the world is alien or otherwise different. Only the ride experience is different. Upon exiting the ride, subjects typically experience feelings of confusion and ill health depending on the subjective time they spent riding SCP-112. These feelings are based not on any physical maladies but the subjective experience of dealing with a physical malady for an extended period of time. For example, a subject with a subjective ride time of three days may experience confusion that he had strong feelings of hunger for most of his ride, but at the end of the ride he was not hungry at all. Addendum A Assorted Experiments Experiment 1123-4534 Subject D-34534 D-34534 was sent on SCP-112 at 2.42 p.m. The train reached Point Alpha at 2.43 p.m. Rematerialization at 2.46 p.m. Upon exiting SCP-112, D-34534 quietly asked for aspirin before passing out. Upon revival and medication, D-34534 reported a subjective ride time of 36 minutes with multiple loops and twists not found on SCP-112's architecture. Experiment 11267564 Subject D-67564 D-67564 was sent on SCP-112 at 1.30 p.m. The train reached Point Alpha at 1.31 p.m. Rematerialization at 1.34 p.m. D-67564 reported a subjective ride time of 4 minutes which D-67564 reported as enjoyable, with the exception of that part where the car jumps off the track and lands right before the loop. Experiment 1125893 Subject D-5893 D-5893 was sent on SCP-112 at 12.30 p.m. The train reached Point Alpha at 12.31 p.m. Rematerialization at 12.34 p.m. At the end of the ride, D-5893 immediately ran to the table with consumables, wordlessly consuming everything he could grab onto, including the wrappers of previously consumed food objects. D-5893 became violent when Foundation staff attempted to subdue him, even going so far as to expunge. Upon capture and interviewing, D-5893 remained confused and disoriented, continuously saying the phrases, No food till the ride is over, let me sleep let the spinning stop, and 
152 lights. The Foundation believes that D5893's statements imply that his subjective ride time was approximately five months long, and during his trip he experienced five months worth of malnutrition and exhaustion, despite no physical proof of these experiences found. Experiment 1127556 Subject D7556 One standard issue camera facing D7556 D7556 was sent on SCP-112 at 11.36 a.m. The train reached point Alpha at 11.37 a.m. Rematerialization at 11.40 a.m. D7556 experienced symptoms similar, but muted, to those of D5893. During the interview, D7556 explained that his subjective ride time was one month and six days long. During his trip, he was unable to eat or sleep and suffered major headaches from SCP-112. D-7556 reported experiencing every sort of roller coaster element currently in use, and a few believed to be conceptual. Camera footage lasting three minutes shows D-7556 sobbing for the duration of the ride, with movement consistent with SCP-112's physical track. Addendum B. Rider Interviews. Experiment 112-35784-23512. Post-Ride Interview 1 Subject D-35784 Interviewer Doctor Interview Type Post-Ride Interview Doctor How are you feeling, 35784? D-35784 Rolls eyes I'm fine It was just a roller coaster ride, dude Maybe you have me confused with the other guy You know, the one that attacked when the ride was over Doctor I will. In time. Describe your experience on SCP-112, please. D-35784. Laughs. What's there to say? Before I was sent to jail, I designed coasters. A couple minutes too long of a ride, you always gotta worry about that. But the twists that thing has are damn good. A few of them I'm pretty sure I mocked up back in the day. It would have been a lot better if the next to me wasn't acting like a damn fool. Doctor. D-23512. What was he doing? D-35784 Size It's what he wasn't doing that pissed me off. He was slouched over so much that his restraints were taut, just facing forward. Think his mouth was open the entire time. If it were possible, I'd say he looked like someone who had been on a crying jag for a few hours. I don't know. When we got that slow point before the banked curve, I tried snapping my fingers in front of him. Idiot just barely turned to face me. And you know what happened afterwards. Doctor. Yes, he punched you. D-35784. Not really a punch, really. Slapped me, shaking me, trying to choke me. I didn't get the impression that he really wanted to kill me, just wanted to get an answer out of me. That's what he said, actually. Shit, like, why didn't you look at me, and why did you not stop cheering the whole time, in a very hoarse voice? Was in mid-question with another when the guards introduced their rifles to the back of his head. Experiment 112-35784-23512 Post-Ride Interview 2 Subject D-23512 Interviewer Dr. Interview Type Post-Ride Interview Forward This interview was conducted three weeks after riding on SCP-112 with D-35784. D-23512 was not willing to speak verbally since his ride. From time to time he attempts to speak, but shows signs of discomfort and pain in doing so, stating that his throat is too sore to talk. While there are no medical issues with D-23512, his experiences have obviously left him traumatized from his experience on SCP-112. Dr. Wood estimates a full recovery is possible before monthly terminations, and at such time he will be capable of estimating precisely how long his subjective ride time was. This interview was conducted through written communication. Given his fixation on certain traits of the ride, this transcript has been edited for brevity. Doctor. Hello, 23512. How are you feeling? D-23512. Still hurts. Still dizzy. Loops and loops. Spins, spins, spins. Forever and ever. Doctor. Why do you say your throat hurts? D-23512. Screamed. Screamed over and over. Girl wouldn't answer me. She never looked at me. I screamed and screamed till I couldn't scream anymore. 
Throat got better. Screamed again. Never looked, never noticed. Just kept cheering the hell of ups and downs and downs and ups and side to side and side to side. Doctor, I'm assuming you're talking about the person who went on the ride with you. 35784. D23512. Girl with the big jiggling tits. Cheered and laughed and cheered and laughed. Every spin, every turn, every twist. Even when it got dark, I could hear her laughing and wooing. Couldn't sleep because of her laughing and cheering. Light and day, bright and dark, always screaming and giggling. How could she do that? Doctor, she told me you were just sitting there, staring ahead. She said she tried to get your attention, but you never responded. D23512. I waved and shook her. She didn't move, didn't notice. Just kept cheering. Tried to tune her out for a few months at a time, but she never, never, never noticed me. Kept cheering, kept screaming, kept laughing at me as I starved and peed myself and slammed my head against the side till I bled. Just kept laughing and screaming through the loops and the spins and the deep dark dips that never ended, never stopped crushing. Doctor, 23512, I'm trying to help you, but acting insane won't help you in the least. There was no injury to your head at the end of the ride. D23512, I there, I felt it. The warm on my head till it got cold and stopped spilling. Still itches. Doctor, so what happened at the end of the ride? You had a bit of an issue with 35784. D23512. She stopped laughing and giggling after all that time, and she looks at me and smiles and says, Nice ride, eh? And I shook her and tried to ask her why she wouldn't stop laughing and screaming. I didn't want to hurt hurt her. Not really. Just wanted to know why. Why? 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 Repeats several times till 23512 is disabled. Item number SCP-119 Object Class Euclid Special Containment Procedures SCP-119 is to remain open and unplugged at all times except during testing. The door to the room in which SCP-119 resides is to be locked for all periods, except during experimentation, with the entry codes given only to authorized research and security personnel. An industrial-grade disinfectant will be available nearby at all times, and the inside of SCP-119 is to be heavily disinfected before any testing. The contents of SCP-119 are to be monitored through the viewing window on SCP-119 at all times during testing, and will be stopped immediately should the contents become hostile or otherwise damaging to SCP-119. Description SCP-119 is a Panasonic microwave oven. It was initially discovered by an agent who had bought it from a liquidation sale of the assets from Valley Vineyards. It is believed that Valley Vineyards was using the anomalous properties of SCP-119 to rapidly age its products and create expensive vintages. Records show that said company was making under-the-table sales of vintages dated as far back as 19... many years before the company's inception in 2005. These sales are what led to the lawsuits accusing the company of falsifying product information and other forms of fraud, which eventually caused Valley Vineyards to declare bankruptcy. SCP-119 appears to be a standard model of microwave in all respects, except that the magnetron unit does not produce microwave radiation. Instead, the magnetron emits a previously unknown type of radiation that accelerates time. The amount of time accelerated is based on the time input given at the start and the power level setting. The time input allows for three digits, and there are five power level settings. On power level one, the number of seconds input equals the number of seconds experienced within the microwave. Therefore, an input of 30 seconds would cause the microwave to run for 30 seconds, at the end of which the object will have aged 30 seconds. Each subsequent power level 1 past 1 causes an exponential increase in the acceleration of time. At power level 2 with an input of 30 seconds, the microwave will run for 30 seconds, and the contents will have aged 900 seconds, 15 minutes, or 30 times 30 seconds. At power level 5, with an input of 999 seconds, the microwave will run for 999 seconds, and the contents will have aged 
964 years. Experimentation with the other buttons on the microwave have not resulted in any anomalous properties, although they do still function as would be expected from a normal microwave. The Minute Plus button, for example, adds 60 seconds, and the defrost function prompts the user to open the door and flip the contents periodically. Pressing the Minute Plus button during operation, however, does not recalculate the adjusted time acceleration, merely causing the contents to age at the pre-calculated rate for another 60 seconds. For example, power level 2 for 30 seconds would age for 900 seconds, 15 minutes. Input of Minute Plus would result in the microwave running for 90 seconds, and aging the contents 2,700 seconds, 45 minutes, or 3 times 30 times 30 instead of aging the contents for 8,100 seconds, 135 minutes, or 90 times 90. SCP-119 can be dismantled, and replacement parts can be substituted for every component except the magnetron. When placing the magnetron in any other microwave, including duplicates of the same model, the magnetron continues to exhibit time acceleration. However, replicating the effects of anything above power level 2 have failed, in every model except the original microwave in which the magnetron was found. Although SCP-119, like all standard microwave models, will normally only function when the door is closed, during deconstruction it was determined that disabling the closing mechanism allows the device to work while open. Subsequent testing determined that the radiation emitted from SCP-119 has a fallout pattern very similar to the microwave radiation it replaced. However, Further experiments operating SCP-119 while open now require the approval of a clearance level 4 personnel. Addendum. After subsequent testing, it has been determined that the accelerated time experienced within SCP-119 is not accelerated from the perspective of those being affected, instead causing the occupants to perceive that they are simply staying inside of the microwave for the adjusted duration. Should living creatures be exposed to SCP-119 for extended durations? they could quite quickly die of starvation, as they will require as much sleep and food as they would outside of SCP-119. Therefore, further experimentation with living beings now requires the approval of a clearance level 4 personnel. Furthermore, due to the possibility of microorganisms undergoing accelerated evolution within SCP-119, industrial-grade disinfectant has now been added to the containment procedure for SCP-119. Test Log for SCP-119 Contents Cup of lukewarm coffee Time input 60 seconds Power level 1 Test results Agent attempted to reheat his coffee. Microwave activated and ran for one minute. Coffee was still cool upon removal. Contents Cup of lukewarm coffee Time input 60 seconds Power level 4 Test Results Agent increased power level, assuming the first setting was too weak. Microwave activated and ran for one minute. Upon opening the door, Agent discovered his coffee had grown a thick layer of mold and scum, consistent with the amount that would be expected from leaving a cup of coffee out for five months. At this point, the agent brought the microwave to the attention of the Foundation. Contents Stopwatch Time input 30 seconds Power level 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. Test Results Series of tests conducted to determine effects of various power levels on time fluctuation. Resulting time on stopwatch was 30 seconds, 15 minutes, 7 hours and 30 minutes, and 99 hours, 99 minutes, and 99 seconds. There was no result for the last test, as the battery had died. Subsequent tests using a more powerful stopwatch with a larger display resulted in 9 days, 9 hours, and 281 days and 6 hours for the last two settings. Contents Radis Norvegicus, Common Lab Rat Time Input 60 Power Level 4 Test Results Testing had expected the subject to age 5 months. Upon starting the timer, subject became a blur barely visible in its rapid movement around the container. At 3 seconds, subject ceased all movement. At 5 seconds, subject began rotting rapidly. Testing was halted at 10 seconds, and SCP-119 is cleaned of excrement and remains of subject. Cause of death was determined to be dehydration. Contents Radis Norvegicus, 
common lab rat, small cage with lining, external automatic food and water dispenser, filled with five months of food and water, attached to tubes routed through air vent. Time input, 60. Power level, 4. Test results. Upon starting the timer, subject became a blur, rapidly moving throughout its cage. Both the food and water supplies drained from their containers rapidly. At 60 seconds, subject was found to be dirty due to its uncleaned cage, but otherwise fine. SCP-119 cleaned. Examination revealed subject to be in poor health due to its living conditions in the uncleaned cage, but with no abnormalities. Contents. One liter of water in a shallow glass bowl. Temperature in room containing SCP-119 lowered to 1 degree Celsius. Time input, 600. Power level, 5. Test results. Time inside SCP-119 intended to be approximately 24.7 years, with an initial input of 60 seconds. Test intended to determine the difference of atmosphere and heat transfer between the inside and outside of SCP-119, as demonstrated by the evaporation of water at near freezing temperatures. The research assistant entering the time added an extra zero, which would bring the total time up to 2,465,753 years, or over 4,000 years a second. Upon pressing start, an immense amount of air began to cycle through the vent. The assistant immediately recognized his mistake and opened the door to stop the timer, at which point a wave of bluish spores emitted from SCP-119 and onto the assistant. The assistant began to choke and quickly asphyxiated. Subsequent testing on atmospheric conditions revealed low oxygen and high carbon dioxide levels, as well as elevated levels of sulfur. The spores were found to be an unknown xerophilic species of mold. Within SCP-119 was a dense ecosystem of molds and tardigrades, water bears, along with numerous other unknown species, some of which do not neatly fit within existing categories. The entire ecosystem has created a balanced atmosphere and seems to have stemmed from the original contents of the water, air, and the assistant. In light of this test, containment procedures have been updated to include industrial disinfectant. Contents None Door is removed from microwave for the duration of this experiment. SCP-119 placed in the middle of a large Faraday cage room with freshly painted floor using paint that changes colors as it dries. Time input, 30. Power level, 3. Test results. SCP-119 remotely activated, and all testing observed remotely. Resultant paint pattern demonstrated the fall off of radiation from the microwave. The paint closest to the front of the door demonstrating 8 hours of drying, and the furthest section of the floor behind the microwave demonstrated closer to 2 hours of drying. Contents, none. Door is removed from microwave for duration of this experiment. SCP-119 is placed in the middle of a large Faraday cage room with dried paint. Lightweight floating debris and dust is released into the room through a vent. Time input, 30. Power level, 3. Test results. SCP-119 is remotely activated, and all testing observed remotely. A pattern of complex air currents reflecting the pattern left by the paint emerges as individual particles float between stronger and weaker radiation. The radiation did not actually apply any force to the particles, but rather affected their momentum in relation to each other, eventually evolving into a detectable air current pattern. Contents SCP-442 Time input 90 Power level 5 Test results SCP-442 continued to keep the correct time during the entire duration showing 1 minute and 30 seconds of time passing over the course of the experiment. Contents SCP-289 Time input 90 Power level 5 Test results None Permission to carry out experiment denied Not funny. Do we really need to explain why that is a bad idea? You already know exactly what that would do. 05 Contents Bottle of Macallan 12-Year Scotch Time Input 60 Power Level 5 Test Results During previous tests, researchers have been joking that they should nuke themselves a drink, and one researcher retrieved a bottle of Macallan from his quarters. 
The 12-year vintage is relatively inexpensive to obtain, but the 25- and 30-year vintages are considered by some to be the best of all scotch commercially available. Upon completion of test, bottle was effectively a 37-year vintage. Intention of test had been to consume during subsequent tests, but at this point the intent had been heard by a superior, who allowed the researchers to keep the bottle as long as they waited until off-duty to consume it. Subsequent testing determined that the results of this experiment were delicious. Dr. Grant It would seem Dr. Grant is a rather poor whiskey connoisseur, as whiskey does not age outside of the barrel. Your delicious experiment resulted in a 37-year-old bottle of 12-year aged scotch. Well done. Dr. Darrell I stand by my initial assessment. Delicious. Dr. Grant Item Number SCP-155 Object Class Safe Special Containment Procedures SCP-155 is contained in a heat-treated and radiation-shielded containment chamber at site. Recovered documentation and the reverse-engineered compiler for SCP-155 are available for all personnel with sufficient clearance on said site's secure file server. But execution of programs on SCP-155 may only be performed with prior permission from at least two Level 3 senior researchers. As of Incident 155-08, experimentation on SCP-155 has been suspended, pending decontamination of SCP-155's former containment chamber and relocation to a new containment chamber. All tasks intended for execution on SCP-155 must now be triple-checked to prevent the possibility of non-halting execution. Description SCP-155 is a complex electronic construct consisting of a highly modified Cray CS-6400 supercomputer, a dedicated radioisotope thermoelectric generator, and a device that is yet to be fully reverse-engineered. SCP-155 was recovered from the basement of Prometheus Labs' primary research laboratory by elements of Mobile Task Force Move 4, debuggers, following the destruction of the facility and subsequent Foundation intervention. When a program and accompanying data is loaded into SCP-155 and executed, SCP-155 generates a spherical temporal distortion field with a radius of approximately 5 meters. Within this sphere of influence, the passage of time is rapidly accelerated resulting in a hyperbolic increase in the effective processing power of SCP-155. Execution begins slowly, as the processing hardware of SCP-155 is dated, but its effective processing power approaches infinity after approximately 8 minutes and 14 seconds of execution. From fragments of documentation recovered from Prometheus Labs, SCP-155 was used to perform massive calculation jobs that would have taken months if not years of processing time with conventional computing devices. Despite its capabilities, operation of SCP-155 is highly dangerous, as heat and radiation generated by SCP-155 are trapped and accumulate during operation, forming a sort of event horizon of energy that is released when execution ends. The execution of programs that exceed six minutes results in enough radiation generated that the containment chamber in which SCP-155 is contained must be decontaminated before research personnel may re-enter. Addendum 155-01 Incident 155-08 On Dr. entered a flawed program into SCP-155 that resulted in non-halting execution, an infinite loop. After attending researchers and technicians realized the error, an emergency shutdown of SCP-155 was initiated, but it could not be fully stopped until execution had exceeded 8 minutes and 3 seconds. At this point, an intense wave of heat and radiation melted through SCP-155's containment chamber, resulting in 11 casualties and the total destruction of the Sea Wing of Site- SCP-155 only received minor damage in the incident but experimentation is suspended while revised safety procedures are under review, and replacement parts are procured to repair components damaged by accelerated aging. Item Number SCP-176 Object Class Euclid Special Containment Procedures 
SCP-176 is contained on-site under the cover of industrial chemical contamination. Any civilians attempting to enter SCP-176 must be detained. Multiple high-speed cameras are set up within the observation room and linked to continuously running analysis computers. If any deviation is observed in the recorded sequence, all recorded data must be immediately backed up and senior staff notified. Description SCP-176 is an abandoned chemical factory situated near Data Expunged. The building consists of a factory floor and an observation room on the second floor, separated from the main room by one-way mirrors. There are three entrances to the building. A three-bay loading dock, whose doors have been welded shut. A ground floor employee entrance. A second floor observation room entrance accessible via a metal staircase on the north end of the building. When the main building is entered via the loading dock or employee entrance, no anomalies are observed, merely an empty room in severe disuse and disrepair, with a small amount of metallic debris consistent with a stripped-down abandoned factory. The inside staircase leading up to the observation room is missing and inaccessible, and so far, Every attempt to enter the observation room via the inside of the factory through the access door or windows has failed. When the observation room is entered via the second floor outside door, a factory observation room consistent in disuse and disrepair to the rest of the building is found. However, when the factory floor is viewed through the observation room windows, the anomalous property of SCP-176 is visible. The view from the observation room window shows a static repeating scene that lasts approximately 11.3 seconds before repeating. Visible through the window is a room of the same dimensions and layout as the factory floor, but painted white and sterilized. Set up in the middle of the room is a huge electronic device of indeterminate function, covering at least 50 square meters and extending approximately 2 meters in height at its highest point. Five individuals in white clean suits appear to be working on the device. Approximately 5.9 seconds into the scene, the employee entrance door bursts open, and four individuals, wearing black tactical armor with no identifying marks or emblems, enter the room and open fire on the research personnel. At 11.3 seconds, the device in the center of the room emits an intense flash of light and radiation, and the scene resets. Analysis of thousands of instances of the scene has shown no variation in the sequence. So far, all attempts at interacting with the scene have failed. Any attempts to breach the window or door from within the observation room are met with resistance, inconsistent with the suggested strength of the materials comprising their frames. To date, all attempts that have resulted in successful penetration of the door or window have resulted in the damage being instantly reverted along with the sequence during the burst of light. Any tools or limbs extended outside of the observation room are cleanly severed and have never been found. Research is ongoing into the nature of the device at the center of SCP-176, as well as the identities of the individuals involved. Addendum 176-1 Further Analysis of Individuals in SCP-176 Analysis has yielded the following information regarding the individuals visible in the scene. Unidentified Researcher Number 1 Male Caucasian, approximately 40 years of age, with brown hair and green eyes. Stands in the southeast corner of the room, reading from a standing monitor. Hit three times in the chest by automatic fire at approximately 8.1 seconds, and appears to be killed instantly. Unidentified Researcher Number 2 Male Asian, approximately 35 years of age, with black hair and brown eyes. Stands to the left of researcher number one, carries a clipboard with indecipherable writing on a notepad. Hit once in right shoulder at 8 seconds, before dropping to the floor, out of sight behind the device. Unidentified researcher number three, female Caucasian, approximately 40 years of age, with brown hair and amber eyes sits at a desk in the southwest corner of the room, working at a computer station, is out of the line of sight when the gunfire begins, and takes cover under the desk, appears to be reaching for a weapon of some sort shortly before the end of the sequence. Unidentified researcher number four, male, Caucasian, 
approximately 45 years of age, with brown hair and indeterminate eyes, stands in front of the device to the northeast, with his back to the observation room, shot twice in the head at 7.2 seconds, killed instantly. Unidentified researcher number 5, male, indeterminate, stands in the northwest corner, mostly obscured, presumably shot at approximately 7.8 seconds and drops down, out of sight. Unidentified assailant number 1, male, indeterminate, wielding a suppressed M4A1, enters first, shoots researcher number 4 and researcher number 5, then moves toward the device. Unidentified assailant number 2, male, indeterminate, wielding a suppressed MP5N, enters second, turns left and shoots researcher number 1 and researcher number 2, then sweeps toward the southeast. Unidentified assailant number 3, male, indeterminate, wielding a suppressed MP5N, enters third, turns right and moves under the observation room. Unidentified assailant number 4, male, indeterminate, wielding a suppressed TMP, stays at the door, covering the others. Item number, SCP-185, Object Class, Euclid. Special Containment Procedures SCP-185 is to be kept in a soundproof room, with noise-filtering microphones for monitoring purposes. Standard guard procedures are to be used for this object. Ear protection must be worn by all occupants in the chamber, excluding test subjects. Description SCP-185 appears to be a Russian R-105M radio, used during the Cold War, except that it has a crudely added keypad, an LCD screen. The object can receive most radio transmissions, including encrypted signals. Attempts to determine how it can break even the strongest of encryptions have so far been fruitless. SCP-185 has a very long range, surpassing even modern radio equipment. It functions as a normal radio, until input is added via the keypad. It seems that if a year is entered into the keypad, the radio will receive transmissions from the specified era, depending on if messages were being broadcast on the set frequency. This function was discovered when, upon entering the random number of 1939, Neville Chamberlain was heard, declaring war on Germany. The possibility of experimenting with dates and times has been noted, and is being researched. The possibility of entering future dates is being discussed. It has yet to be decided whether the benefits outweigh the risk of causing a time paradox. On the inside, the radio appears to be unaltered, and the keypad is contained in a box affixed to the side of the radio. Researchers cannot access the keypad, due to the box being made from a metal that is yet to be identified. It cannot be cut, and there are no determinable ways to disassemble it. Addendum Document Number 185-1 Incident 1. During a test, the year was set to negative 13.73 billion during the time the universe was suspected to have been created. Sound volumes emitted by the object could not be measured with standard equipment. Survivors further from the incident reported rumbling sounds, similar to recorded radio emissions from the sun. All those within 200 meters of the epicenter died of asphyxiation. Sound waves had ruptured capillaries in the lungs. Autopsy reports indicate that the victims essentially drowned in their own blood. The device failed to operate for some time after the incident, and it was found that the device's internal battery pack had failed. Replacing it restored functionality. It was noted that the LCD screen was still lit, suggesting that the device has no special power aside from the anomalous box. The sound waves have also rendered SCP inoperable, leading to the reclassification of said SCP as neutralized. The radio seems to have received no damage. Structural damages have been reported on site, and a section had to be shut down for repairs. Testing has been postponed until further notice. Dr. Any personnel caught using the object to listen to music on duty will be disciplined. Object Request Mobile Task Force Delta-5 is requesting to use SCP-185 to aid their mission of tracking down objects before our rivals. Task Force believes Iranians have important information 
and wish to intercept their transmissions. Request accepted. Item number SCP-196 Object Class Euclid slash Keter Special Containment Procedures SCP-196 must be kept wholly ignorant of any information regarding the reason for his containment. The subject is to be kept in a two-room cell inside Site-17. The cell is to be furnished with whatever SCP-196 requests, as long as the request does not show any obvious likely lethal use, and does not violate any SCP procedure. Subject must cohabit with at least one member of the site's Level 2 security personnel, who must be armed exclusively with non-lethal weaponry. Subject is allowed to freely wander the installation if accompanied by at least one member of Site 17 security personnel. Note that all staff below Level 3 have been told he is a safe class object. SCP-196 has agreed to wear a satellite tracking anklet. Subject was told that removal of this anklet would result in his death, but this is not actually the case. SCP-196 displays no extraordinary physical ability. Thus, probability of escape is negligible. Description SCP-196 appears to be a middle-aged male, under 2 meters tall, of African-American descent. He claims to be 47 years old. Subject has black hair and brown eyes. There are no abnormal physical characteristics. Subject displays all basic needs of a normal human being. Subject tested with an IQ of 109, well within normal parameters. Subject's psychological examination indicated that he suffers from institutionalization and Stockholm Syndrome in relation to the Foundation's security staff. SCP-196 demonstrates no Euclid type or other abnormal abilities. Note, I've run the full battery of tests and the exam says the guy is normal. Dr. Addendum 196-1 SCP-196's origin and subsequent Keter classification. SCP-196 appeared inside of Site- Date undisclosed. SCP-196 claims he was recruited through standard Class D recruitment procedures for testing of SCP- Subject also claims that his younger self is currently living in another location in- Genetic identification checks confirm that SCP-196 has encountered Foundation security personnel in the past, in an incident at Site-17, in 1960. During that incident, SCP-196 was far older and was killed by SCP security personnel during an attempted break-in at that facility. SCP-196 was, at that time, not known to the Foundation as anything other than a lone human assailant. However, he was found to be carrying SCP and several purely mundane weapons. While a Euclid class event of this nature would normally result in an individual being terminated to prevent any potential for a catastrophic paradox, SCP-196's future self is already dead. This means that if he were permitted to die, a catastrophic paradox could occur, damaging or destroying this continuity. SCP-196 must be kept alive until he decides to and successfully manages to escape of his own accord and somehow travels back to experience his own death while carrying SCP- Note that because of the potential for paradox, SCP-196 must be kept far away from his younger double. Additionally, a covert observation team must be permanently attached to SCP-196's younger self to protect his life. This dedicated security force should otherwise not intervene. Failure to permit the timeline from unfolding naturally could result in damaging or destroying this continuity. For these reasons, SCP-196, despite being otherwise mundane, must be carefully monitored and has been classified as a Euclid slash Keter class object. Lesson complete. To continue with your orientation training, Subscribe to SCP Orientation right now and make sure you don't miss any of our upcoming videos.